I'm excited to continue into week four of our Advent series, and I hope this series has been a blessing for you like it has been for, for me and my family. Uh, we have been able to, uh, these weeks leading up to Christmas, kind of slow down and realize that Jesus' birth, uh, death, and resurrection is the reason we get to celebrate uh, this season, right? And this Advent series is the reminder of the coming Jesus reflecting on his life here on earth and looking forward to the day in which he will make everything perfect and fulfilled. So far over these last three weeks, we've looked at hope, right? We looked at hope where God is our anchor, right? And, and we can put our hope in the fact that he will not disappoint us. And then week two, we looked at at peace and how God's peace is different than the world's peace. How we try to build peace by doing things to sort of stabilize our life, right? But God's peace is different and true peace comes from God. And then last week, Pastor Andrew walked us through joy. Not happiness, right? Hear me. But joy and how joy is remaining regardless of your circumstances, but it's a choice that you have to make. Say, choose joy. Choose and today, I get the opportunity to talk with you about love. Say, love. love. Uh, you know, Andrew said, I'm the youth pastor here, uh, and if I'm going to ask my students to pay attention to me longer than like 45 seconds, I have to have them interact with me, right? Or else they're going to check out. And so if I ask you to interact with me, would you please not leave me up here by myself? You guys have done great so far. But today we are going to talk about love. I read a study this last week done by marriage.com. And I want to read three quick facts about love to you today. Number one is, did you know that you can fall in love in as little as four minutes? Now, I don't mean like an online dating app where they'll like send you a wife or something. That's weird. I mean, but do you know you can fall in true love in as little as four minutes? The study said falling in love does not take nearly as long as we think it does. It is proven that you can fall in love in four minutes. It takes less than four minutes to make a first impression, and often this leads to love. And that is why it said you must pay attention to your body language and the presence that you carry. Number two, did you know that love actually makes you brave? What do I mean by that? It says love leads to the deactivation of the amygdala. That's a fun word. Uh, in the brain. And this, the amygdala, is what regulates fear. Thus, you are less scared of outcomes and consequences when in love. Anybody done anything dumb due to love before? If you can't say amen, say oh me. Uh, you experience a fearlessness and a bravery that you usually wouldn't feel. And the third one, uh, and this one is the one that really I, I pondered on for the longest. Talked about socializing with the one that you love. Said on average humans will spend approximately 1,800 days socializing with the one that they love or choose to marry. This is talking about constant communication. That's 43,200 43, hours of nonstop talking back and forth with each other. This number seems large, right? But it also makes you take a step backward and appreciate like the late night, one hour conversations with the person you love, right? It, it almost made me view it as like this ticking clock of every minute that I talk to my wife. It's almost like this, this, talk, this clock ticking down to where I would no longer have that. And it made me put it into perspective, right? And I came to the conclusion that I'm just going to be way above average because I want more than 43 thousand hours talking to my wife uh, in 1800 days just isn't enough but it also made me think if that's the person that I love here on earth how much time do we spend talking with God right if at the end of your life they did a, a summary total of how many days consecutively that you spent with God or hours or or down to the minute and second how much time would you have spent with the creator 
of the universe. And I want to be known as somebody that makes time for him. Right? When we talk about love and that God is love, I want to make time for God. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the busyness of life, right? The holiday season is a great time for us to reflect and slow down. But throughout the rest of the year, we often get caught in the busyness of life. And it can cause us to kind of put our love for God on the back burner. But before I get into too much of my message, I'd like to pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. God, I pray that as I I preach this message that you've laid on my heart, God, that it would be your words that flow through me. God, that I would, that you would remove me out of the way. God, and that you would flow in this place today. God, I thank you right now for every person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you continue to bless them and show them your love. And I thank you for this church, your church, generations, and everybody said... Amen. Today, as we continue on our Advent series, uh, the point I want you to take home today is simple, right? So if you're, if you're like one of my youth students that I usually only get about five minutes with, uh, you might want to write this one down. And it's really simple. It's three words. It's God is love. Man, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear that God is love. So if you're lacking love, look to God. If you're in need of love, look to God. If you want to learn how to love better, look to God. Because God is love. Not God is loving. Right? He is love. Everything that he does is love. So... If you wanted a quick message, there it is. But I hope that you don't check out with me because I got a lot of good stuff still in here. But the overarching theme that we've carried through this year's Advent series is that there's two things. There's a worldly version to look at hope, peace, joy, and love. And there's a kingdom-minded version of hope peace, joy, and love. And today I want to look at both perspectives so that we can walk forward together better. And we want to be a church that is focused on living out these four things as God intended, not as the world has distorted. And Advent is one of the coolest times throughout the year that we get to be a part of something bigger, right? Advent, the series, is not something that just Generations Church is choosing to do through these five weeks, right? Uh, But this is something that churches all across America and all across the globe are doing together where they're walking through these these five weeks in order, week by week. And so today, as I'm talking to you about love, there's thousands and thousands of other churches that we get to do it with. And it's so cool to be a part of something bigger. If you have your Bible with you, you today. My first scripture reference is going to be from the book of Romans chapter 12. If you turn there with me, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation uh, if you have it on your phone and you'd like to follow along. So that's Romans 12 verse 9 through 18. It starts out like this. Don't just to p- pretend to love others, but really love them. I mean, I'm going to say that again. Don't just pretend To love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Verse 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. That's for somebody. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't, cur- don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Ouch. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people And don't think that you know it all. I know that's for someone in here today. 
Verse 17, my God, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. And lastly, verse 18, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I love that verse 9 that said, do not just pretend to love others, but really love them. Do you know what the definition of love is? Like, I actually pulled this uh, from the Webster Dictionary on Google. Uh, it says, love is an intense feeling of deep affection or fondness. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection or fondness. I want you to take a second, everybody in here, and I, wanna th I want you to think with me. Think, when I say love, what do you love? I'm not asking you to call it out. Just think in your mind. What do you love? If you are married, maybe you thought of your spouse. If you are a parent, maybe you thought of your kids. If you're spiritual because you're sitting in church, maybe you thought of Jesus. Uh, if you missed breakfast this morning, maybe you thought of food. Anybody in here think of food? You're like, man... Love is a feeling we all desire, and God designed us that way on purpose. But quick question for everybody in here. Did anybody think, when I asked you, what do you love? Did you think I love myself? Did anybody think, I love myself? Not in a self-righteous way, okay, hear me. But do you love the way God created you? I think this is where a disconnect starts, is if we struggle to love ourselves. And hear me when I say this. This is my first point, actually. Your capacity to love others is capped based on your ability to love yourself. Your capacity to love others is capped based on your ability to love yourself. And I'm not just saying this, okay? These are not just my words. This is from Scripture, actually in Scripture, Matthew 22. Let's look at that together. Matthew 22 opens up with saying, Teacher, which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? They're talking to Jesus. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, right? But then verse 39 says this, A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. If God is commanding us to love our neighbor as ourself, but we cannot love ourself, how can we therefore love our neighbor? Verse 40, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. God has commanded you, church, to love yourself. Not just the best version of yourself. Not just the version of yourself that you put out on social media. Not just the version of yourself that you want to or aspire to be. But God is commanding you to love yourself right here and right now. And you need to love yourself as God loves you. 1 John 4 verse 9 through 10 said, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. I love you, church, but I wouldn't send my son. I, I love my son more than anything, right? But God sent his son knowing the sacrifice that he would have to make for you. Sitting right in the seat, God sent his son to earth, knowing that he would eventually die for you sitting in this room right now. He made this sacrifice so that we could gain eternity. Verse 10. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 
He gave up his son to come to earth and live among us, right? To live as one of us, knowing that he would eventually be killed on the cross. You see, Jesus was part two of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He put on a human-like body to be like one of us. But we often imagine God coming to earth as this like man in his 30s, right? God the carpenter who's preaching. But God came to earth as a baby. You know what that means? That means he had to be burped after being fed. Like that means, that means he took naps as a baby. That means he was a kid running up in the aisles and stuff having fun. God came to earth as a baby, and he has experienced life just like you and I have, right? But honestly, he's experienced a whole lot worse than we have. He was cursed. He was beaten. He was persecuted. And he still loved because Jesus knew the power of love. Do you know that there's power in love? There's power in love. In love. God's love is not just meant, this is my second point, by the way. God, God's love is not just meant to be known in our minds, but experienced in our hearts. If God's love is just something that you think about, you're missing out, church. It's something that we're supposed to experience in our heart, it is not some distant, figure of our imagination, it is all around us. We experience God's love in many ways, right? We can experience it through prayer. We can experience God's love through, through reading scripture and reflecting on it. We can experience God's love through community. Have you ever felt loved in community before? Man, we can experience God's love when we look around us. Like God didn't have to make the earth beautiful. Like, but we can experience God's love through, through not taking for granted the mountains that we live around. Coming from Iowa, when we would go out, right now we would see two things. We would see plowed cornfields, which are flat and just look like mud pits. Uh, and we would see snow starting to cover those uh, and making the roads gross and making our cars dirty and all of that. Like, God did not have to make the mountain's beautiful like he did. But it's a way that we get to experience his love is through his creation. And we are his creation. God's love is all around us and it's not meant to just be known in our mind. It's meant to be experienced in our hearts. God's love for us too. I want to talk about this. Uh, God's love for us is a covenant. You know that? And, and so often we can view love as a commitment versus a covenant. And so I wanted to break down the difference between covenant and commitment. Do you guys know what the difference between a commitment and a covenant is? A commitment by definition is a man-made promise or agreement with no repercussions of not following through on. But a covenant is a binding contract. Theologically speaking, a covenant is a promise for God that is never returned void. There's over 60 written promises in the Bible, and I want to look at a couple of the covenants and promises that Jesus made to us. Deuteronomy 31.8 said, the Lord himself goes before you, right? The covenant, I will, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalms 145.9 says, the Lord is good to all. That is a covenant that he has with us. Isaiah 40, 29 is the covenant where God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8 said he will bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all you need. Psalms 145, 18 says the Lord is near. That is a covenant for him to be near at all times. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, then you will call on me, and I will listen to you. He will not leave you high and dry. He's right next to you. These are covenants and promises that Jesus had made to us. 
But how many of us have made commitments, right? The reason we struggle to trust God's promises is because we don't view them as a co- covenant, right? We view them as a commitment. And when we think of commitments, I think all of us can think of a time or two where we've fallen short on our promises, right? Like we're heading into the new year. And you know what I hate about the new year? is how busy the gyms get. Like, if you're somebody that goes to the gyms a few times a week, that first week of the year, they're the busiest they will ever be. You can't find a parking spot. Like, you struggle to find a piece of equipment to work on. Like, but what happens week two? They're empty, right? Or what about the people that commit to, like, eat healthy? This is one that I always struggle with. And I do good usually about one week, and then like I'll wake up on a Saturday morning after a long work week, and I'll be like, some Chick-fil-A breakfast sounds real good about now. Like, I struggle with that, and I'm sure we all do because it's a commitment that doesn't have God at the middle of it. But you see, the difference is, is like a marriage, Right? When we view a marriage as a covenant, that's why we do a ceremony in the Christian faith in which we bring God into the center of the marriage. That makes it not a covenant between man and woman, but a covenant between man, woman, and God. There is a transformative nature of Jesus' sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins and the establishment of a new relationship between God and humanity. And this is a covenant. We are flawed people made of flesh. So our commitments tend to fail if we do not bring God into them. But guess what? We struggle to love because we are human and carry thing, this thing called free will. We struggle because we carry free will. And as easy as it is for me to love someone, it's just as easy for me to hurt them, right? And love is easily forgotten when we are suffering. Could you imagine, though, if love was lost when Jesus was suffering on the cross? That had to have hurt. I'm thankful every day that I wasn't up on there. Love is easily forgotten when we are hurting and when we are suffering. But it is important to note that everyone's spiritual journey is unique. Right? There are many people in this room that have experienced a type of suffering that I've never experienced. Maybe you've lost a loved one or a child or a spouse Maybe you've lost a job which caused you to go into a financial spiral in which maybe you lost a house or a vehicle. Maybe you've experienced trauma from relationships or domestic violence or or unemployment. Whatever it may be, you have experienced trauma. And I want to say, like, as I was writing this, I think it's so easy for the church to acknowledge trauma, but I want to say, like, I'm sorry that you go through that. Like, man, that sucks. Do I have the words to explain why God allows us to go through it? No. But, man, like, as a church, this is where we get to come together, and we get to stand side by side and go through it together and let each other know that we're not alone. And I don't know why we have to go through things, but I do know this. And this is my third point. Wherever suffering comes from, it is promised that it will go to good if we open it to God. Wherever suffering comes from, it is promised that it will go to good if we open it up to God. Open ourselves to God's plan and carry the character of of God. And this will take sacrifice. But ask yourself, do I carry the character of God? Right? Do we have the character to pursue love with God? Do you think you have that ability when you're going through trauma, when you're going through tough times, do you have the character to pursue love 
with God because love itself is self-giving. It's giving up your seat on the bus when somebody needs to sit and you know that you can stand. It's getting up in the middle of the night, right, for a crying child. Maybe at work it's taking over a project for a stressed coworker. The main way that we learn to love, though, is through experiencing suffering. Whether our suffering is from God or from Satan or even from our own stupid decisions, God's promise, though, is that if we give it to him, he will allow it to transform us and grow and mature us into a group of people who lead by love, joy, peace, hope in the kingdom as God has designed it. Just like Pastor Andrew always says, you were created on purpose for a purpose. And in closing, I want to take a, a look at the most famous verse about love used in almost every Christian marriage ceremony in the world. And that's 1 Corinthians 13. Do you guys know how I was going there? Let's read it real quick together. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, but if I have and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is a knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. Verse 13. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? I remember growing up, my parents, anytime I would argue with my brother or sister, they would make us go to the table and get out my dad's Bible, and we'd have to write it, this whole chapter. And if we were still angry at the end of writing it, my mom would be like, go back and write it again. Like, I remember specifically like summer days, like she would just set out like a, a notebook and a Bible in, in preparation for us arguing and her just being like, hey, go to the kitchen table. You need to, you need to write that a couple times. And, and I remember my mom teaching me to do this. I want to look at a portion of that scripture again, starting at verse 4. She said, anytime you see the word love, change it to your name. And I've heard many pastors and preachers say to do this, but I want to do this as a church together. I want you to put your name where it says love and in the areas where it says um, it as well. So it would go like this. Noah is patient. Say your name. Noah. <laughs> Andrew just changed his name to Noah in case you guys missed that. Um, all right, let's try it again. I'll count three. One, two, three. Noah is patient and kind. Noah is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. 
Noah does not demand its own way. Noah is not irritable, and Noah keeps no record of being wronged. Noah does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Noah never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. When you are struggling, I would challenge you to open your Bible up and read that. When you are struggling, I would challenge you to replace that love with your name. Whether it's your marriage that's struggling, whether you have a coworker that's upsetting you, whatever you're going through, take a second to reflect and allow God to transform you because God is love. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you today. God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for for being good even when we are not. And I pray that as we leave here today, God, that we would show the world your love. And God, that we would we would allow ourselves to be loved and we would view ourselves the way that you love us. And I thank you for today. In Jesus name. Everybody said Amen. we have our kids program coming in right now. They're going to be singing a few songs for us, as well as doing today's Advent reading. It's not just about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angels who sing for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds on the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross, it's about my sin, it's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. Just about the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I've won. It's not about the righteousness that I find within. It's all about His precious blood that saved me. It's about the stone that was rolled.
Today we relight the candles of hope, peace, and joy alongside the fourth candle of Advent, which is, represents love. It reminds us of how Jesus, like a caring shepherd, showed love and kindness to everyone he met. During Advent, we are encouraged to be kind, share with others, and help those in need, just like Jesus did. This special time teaches us the joy of giving and being thoughtful. God's love for us is like guiding light, showing us how to be loving and kind to one another. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find important lessons about being loving and generous, just like just as God loves us. For, for the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty, uh, and the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 through 19. Psalms, verse 89, 1, and 2. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is enduring as the heavens. Your love burns brighter, your warmth in our heart. Your love burns brighter, tears darkness apart. Your love burns brighter and shines with no end. Your love burns brighter, on your light we depend. Dear Lord, we declare that your love lasts forever and you will always keep your promises, just like the sky stays up high. Please teach us to love God. Help us remember to follow Jesus and put you first. Let us feel your love and share with it with others. As we get ready to celebrate Jesus being born, fill our hearts with love for the whole world. We want everyone to know your love and your son, our savior. Amen. Yeah. We want to invite everybody to sing happy birthday to Jesus with the kids whenever they start. All right, give it up for the kids as they head back. And thank you, Noah, for that great message on love and what a good reminder for us in this season, right? So, um, and, you know, part of the this season as we've had the challenge every single one is to not... You know, first, like Noah said, that it, our, our capacity to love others starts with learning to love ourselves. But that I don't think we really learn love and what love is. You can't love and learn it without other people, the people who are loving you and that you be able to return that love to them and then take it out to the world of, of people that are in need of love everywhere. So as you go out of these doors today, go and be love because love is inside of you because God is love. Amen. 